On Inside the Middle East, a vibrant journey of discovery to the cultural heart pulsing through the region. First stop, Cairo, where I meet a rising star of the Arab film industry. I try to uh, act as much as possible in, in, in theatre groups yeah. or uh, independent short films and it, it, somehow it picked from there. Plus, far from the madding crowd, Sample the hidden delights of Beirut, unknown to all but the most intrepid traveller. All that and more on Inside the Middle East. Hello and welcome to this special edition of Inside the Middle East with me, Becky Anderson. Now, for the last month, I've crisscrossed the Middle East, meeting cultural icons, innovators and creators defining this region and, by the way, clocking up 14,000 kilometres along the way. We'll first stop Cairo, where during the holy month of Ramadan, millions of eyes are glued to the television. In Egypt, a big part of the holy month of Ramadan is TV. After breaking the fast at sunset, at family gatherings and in cafes across the capital, screens blast a wide range of thrillers, dramas and comedies made especially for this month. Scripts push the envelope when it comes to politics, sex, language and to a certain extent religion. Plot twists become the centre of heated debates as viewers pick favourites to follow. Punchlines and catchphrases become the new pop culture references. Over 30 TV serials compete for attention during Ramadan. Newspapers dedicate pages to show listings and a new phone app even helps make them more interactive. And even though the numbers were down compared to previous years, there's still an estimated $140 million spent on producing the shows a similar amount spent on ads played out during them. All of the industries in Egypt suffered, including TV, yet somehow there's still lots of money to be made in TV. In terms of there's lots of commercial ads, there is acquisitions from lots of like satellite TV channels. Ramadan is still the biggest TV season. It's like the Super Bowl of, of, you know, like of, of, uh, of, of Arab TV, except that it goes for, for an entire month. Film stars now headline their own shows on TV. Aspiring young actors find a path to stardom. A marathon of filming and editing spills over to Ramadan. It is a lot of pressure, definitely, because uh, you are competing uh, with superstars and you are competing with very professional people, uh, directors, actors and everything. And uh, it, it, all, the, all this is happening in 30 days. Halfway through Ramadan, Yusuf was still filming for the Lad Tanazoli, or countdown drama. He plays Salim, a university professor who turns to terrorism after being tortured in prison. The action-packed drama takes cue from reality. News of explosions and deadly clashes are now the norm. Political themes which flourished after the 2011 revolution fluctuate in accordance with developments on the ground. With taboos being tested and broken every year, the TV shows not only mirror what's happening in society, but also influence it, leading Ramadan TV to constantly reinvent itself. And the results have been impressive to viewers and critics alike. Um, so there's been definitely, as I said, like, you know, like radical improvement in, in quality, like aesthetically, narratively. Um, conceptually uh, and especially acting wise. Ramadan ends but many of the shows continue keeping viewers tuned in for melodramatic finales before it all happens next year. Asa Yassin got his break playing a character in a soap opera. Now he's a major star of Egyptian cinema. I caught up with him in Cairo. I'm fascinated uh, by your background because you started out in life or all the life, as it were, as, as an engineer. Yeah. It's not the obvious route through to acting, is it? No, it's not. But actually, you can relate it to production, because I, I studied mechanical engineering, which is majoring in production, industrial production, and mm. I can relate this to definitely movie production and uh, optimization and cost efficiency and, and all this. But something must have clicked. And you, w when was it that you decided, oh, you know, I'm going to try this. I'm going to give it a yeah. go. Uh, I think. Back in the days when I was in the university and uh, 
um, a, a friend of mine knew that I was uh, really interested into acting and mm -hmm. knowing about uh, right, like I sort of wrote some um, analysis about films. Uh, definitely at the time was Pacino and De Niro was mm -hmm. The Godfather and uh, sure. uh, Scarface and all. So he knew that and he told me, why don't you just come and audition? I, and I really didn't want to audition or try myself out in, in something I didn't know whether mm -hmm. I would be good at or not. So he told me that there's a role who who who's not there anymore and there's a, a, a cast member uh, just mm. left and you can just come and meet the director and take it from there and since then I was hooked. <laughs> Your last film, Rags and Tatters, you play a convict who has escaped prison during the 2011 revolution here in Egypt. Your character affected by the revolution, and yet, um, in and of itself, he, he he isn't involved. It's irrelevant to him. Can you explain uh, what was going on there? Definitely not about the revolution. It's about the people. It has it has a very subliminal message of all the people who went to their revolution, who didn't go, mm. of, of those who we speak of, that their, their, their conditions are like that, their, the, the poverty, the mm. illiteracy, the, all of these things, and yet their conditions before the revolution and through the revolution and post-revolution still remain the same. Mm. You're talking about marginalized Egyptians here, the marginalized statistics Marginalized Egyptians, them. which we use in, in our slogans, which we use in our, uh, in, in, our uh, in, the, in the protests, in the newspapers, in the media titles, the headlines. And, and yet nothing happened to them. And yet the speaking of them is just, it's just words. It wasn't mm. really action. So when you really translate this into a dramatic film that could be documented or considered like a, a, a historical uh, social doc, uh, documentation mm -hmm. for this period of time for these people that we actually thought of and mm -hmm. taught and, and demonstrated and, and demonstrate for. And, for. And, yeah. So this is actually a reference. And I've met while I've been in Egypt, lots of people who were in the square with you protesting at the time, they are disillusioned, they are disappointed, uh, they feel they were, some of them, naive. Um, they're not optimistic about the future. Do you sympathize with those people? Definitely, because I think, like I said earlier, that, that I have, since I was born, which is thir 33 years ago, mm -hmm. that there is only one president. And all of a sudden, in four years, we have four presidents and two revolutions. That's quite interesting. And I'm, I'm sure this is something to think of rather than just get stuck in the fact mm. that whether this revolution worked or not, whether what, it was a revolution or not, whether what's going to happen later on. I, I believe in a... Nagib Mahfouz has a very good saying that I really believe in, which says that the present is a light that flickers between two darknesses. Mm. Well, you can't have the two darknesses, the future, you can't have it without the present. And you can't just look at the past because you'll just mm. shy away from the present. After the break, we are in Istanbul, a city where East meets West and where, as I found, ancient traditions still stand tall amid the city's modern cultural landscape. <laughs> 